Okay, so in this talk, I will be addressing one particular type of factorization algorithm known as the elliptic curve method. So before I start, I will just tell you what the problem is. The problem is that we are given an integer n and we are trying to find the prime factorization of it. Except most modern algorithm doesn't actually go completely, it just finds one non-trivial proper factor, which is clearly enough for factorization purposes because we can just keep on factoring it if it's not already prime. And here, you should note that non-trivial means the factor is not equal to one and proper means the factor is not equal to n. Uh, the current fastest algorithm for factorization is the general number field sieve with runtime equal to that thing. And that thing turns out, you realize when you input an integer n, your inputting is digit, so the input size is order log n. So this thing turns out to be sub-exponential because it's exponential of log n raised to the power of a third. So it's still not fast enough for a feasible purpose for feasibility, and I believe our current record for factorization using the general number field C is something at around 400 digits. And another thing you should notice about this runtime is that it only depends on the size of N, and not really on any internal structure of N. And there are algorithms which explore the, which exploit the internal structure of N to produce uh, to give, produce a factor more quickly than the general number field sieve. Uh, a trivial example, so to speak, is the trip trial division. You start by, try, by dividing by two, then by three, then by five, then by seven. And so if your number n has a very low prime factor, then you can very quickly find it, much quicker than the general number field sieve. Uh, another a factorization algorithm which I will not explain is the Fermat factorization method, which will quickly find any factor of n which is close to the square root of n. And then there is a special number field C, which is used for factoring special numbers, those of the form r to the e plus minus s, where r and s are small. So since, for example, the Mersenne numbers 2 to the n minus 1, or the Fermat numbers 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 are of so this algorithm is designed for those numbers. And the topic of this talk is the elliptic curve method. And this is special purpose, its runtime is dependent on the minimal prime divisor of n. So if your number n has a prime divisor, say, between 20 and 40 digit long, then the elliptic curve method can quickly find that factor and extract it regardless of how large n actually is. Before we begin, I will give some motivation. Uh, recall from, I suppose, discrete math for massless theorem that if p is prime and a is co-prime to p, then a to the power of p minus one is congruent to one mod p. From this, we have the following: that so first we suppose p is a factor of n, and then we suppose p minus one has the properties. We suppose m is a number which happens to be a multiple of p minus one. Then we know by Fermat's little theorem that p is a divisor of a to the m minus one, and p is a divisor of n by choice. So p would divide the greatest common divisor of a to the m minus one and n, and this would obviously be a factor of n. So if we could somehow manage to find an m, which is a multiple of p minus one, we would get a non-trivial divisor of n. And the natural question to develop this into an algorithm is how do we find m so that this is better than just trial trial division. And the idea is we want M to contain all small prime powers. Uh, so in particular, we take M to the, be the multiple of all prime powers less than or equal to a certain search limit B, i.e. we take M to be the least common multiple of the first B numbers. Uh, this M is what we call a smooth number, and in general, a number X is called B smooth if any prime factor of it is less than or equal to B and it's B power smooth, and this is a stronger condition if any prime power divisor of it is less than or equal to B. Equivalently, this is saying the number is actually a divisor of M. So in particular, we know that if P is a divisor of N and P minus one is B power smooth, then the greatest common divisor of A to the M minus one at N is a non-trivial factor. So now we can consider an example. 
Uh, we can take n to be 3 to the 1, 136 plus 1, this has 64 digits, but obviously it has a divisor, which is 2. It turns out to have a bunch of other small divisors. Once we take that out, we still have a composite number, and that's sort of difficult to factor. But with this process I described above, which is known as the p minus 1 algorithm, we can very quickly find this. We take b to b equal to 25,000, and if you note know that p is a prime divisor of n, uh, and p minus y is this number, all of which prime factors are less than 25,000. So because of that special property of a prime divisor of p, we can quickly factor n using the p minus 1 algorithm. But you should note that the p minus 1 algorithm is really not guaranteed work. One point is that I said above that the greatest common divisor is going to be a non-trivial factor. I didn't say it's going to be a proper factor. but it's that's really not an issue because the probability that it's not proper is very low and that can be proven. But the second, more, far more serious problem is what if our prime divisor of n, no prime divisor of n, satisfies this nice property that p minus y happens to be b power smooth for some reasonably small b. So this uh, means we need to look for extensions of this algorithm. Before that, let me just abstract away some and look at some essential features of this algorithm. And how this works is that uh, we first have a group. Recall that a group is a set with a binary operation which is, has an identity and has an inverse that is associative. So in particular, the set of integers co prime to p under multiplication by p form a group under multiplication with identity element equal to 1. So, so we want to work over those type of groups, but we cannot because we don't know p. That's what we are trying to find. So we are actually going to be working modulo n. And conveniently, multiplication modulo n is compatible with multiplication modulo p in the sense which you probably can guess. And one important property is that if we somehow manage to produce an element which is an identity, so in the case of multiplicative group mod p, we somehow find an element k, which is congruent to 1 mod p. We only know k mod n, but then we can take the greatest common divisor of k minus 1 and n, and that's going to give us a non-trivial divisor of n. This is a key property. And to the fourth, the fourth thing is, how do we get to the identity? Well, from us, little theorem says, if we, raise a, if we raise any element a to a large enough power, we are going to produce an identity mod p. So in particular, if p minus 1 is power smooth, we don't actually need to raise it to such a big power. And from us, little theorem in this context is actually a special case of something much more general known as Lagrange's theorem, that if g is an arbitrary group and x is an element of g, uh, and n is the number of elements of g, then x to the n is equal to 1. And in particular, we know that if g, uh, that absolute value sign means the number of elements of G. So if G, the size of G is B power smooth, then for any element X in the group, X to the power of this least common multiple C is going to equal to one. So in fact, we are going to, we are seeking groups G such that one, in some sense, once we have an identity in G, that gives, you, gives us information about factorization of N. And two, we want the size of G to be smooth. Turns out smooth numbers and power smooth numbers are not that different. So I will mainly be talking about smooth numbers. But recall the failure of the P minus one algorithm is that you may get very unlucky. Actually, you don't need to be very unlucky to the you would you can get very unlucky and none of the prime factors of N happens to be one plus a very smooth number. So if we just work with one group G, we can also, we could also be similarly unlucky. So it's, much, it's a much safer bet that we should look for a family of groups with varying sizes so that we can say at least one of them should give us a smooth group order. And so that group is going to give us a factorization. And the way we produce this family of groups is we are elliptic curves. For the purpose of this talk, an elliptic curve is given by an equ cubic equation y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are integers, satisfying the technical condition that for a cubed plus 27b squared is not equal to zero. Uh, uh, except this is important, we add another point that's called the point at infinity. Uh, 
So for example, this is a elliptic curve, y squared equals x cubed plus 17, a equals to zero, b equals to 17. So what's the, what is the point at infinity? You should think of it as somewhere over here. Uh, so in particular, each vertical line not only intersects the curve at two normal points, it also intersects it at the point at infinity. But not the slanted line. A slanted line intersects the elliptic curve at exactly three normal points. And that is how we, we can use that to define an addition of points on an elliptic curve as such. If I'm given two points P and Q on a curve, let's say for the moment that they are just regular points, then we draw a line through it, the line is going to intersect the curve at a third point, we call it R, then we reflect R across the x-axis and to get a point which we defined to be P plus Q. So uh, what about the point at infinity? If you have the point at infinity, it's somewhere over here. And then you, let's say over here, you have a point P which you want to add to the point at infinity. So you draw a line between them, which would be a vertical line. So it would intersect the elliptic curve at this point over here. And then you reflect it back to P. So point of, the point at infinity acts as an identity for this group operation. Uh, similarly, if you try to add P plus Q and R, you would connect the line, it's a vertical line, so it intersects it at a third point, which is a point at infinity, flip it over, you are still at infinity. So if two points are reflections of each other across the x-axis, then their sum is equal to the point at infinity. The whole thing, you do not have to do geometry for this one, the whole thing can be given by some complicated algebraic expression, which I include for the sake of completeness. But there is one key feature you should notice you can implement this whole thing on a computer, but if it just happens that two points add together to the point at infinity, you need to compute this parameter lambda. And lambda involves division by zero if they happen to add up to the point at infinity. And your computer is going to return an error. And this turns out is how we, go, how we are going to get a non-trivial factorization because the computer cannot compute the sum of two points. But more on that later. For now, we will ob simply observe the following properties which I have alluded to earlier. A point at infinity is an identity. The group law is commutative, obviously. Uh, there always exists an inverse, so their proof is easy. And if you recall the definition of group, we are missing the final property known as associativity, which is sort of important, and things that people usually don't think about. Except in this case, associativity is quite hard to prove. You can use the formula I gave you on the previous slide and go back and check. Uh, you can do that. There are nice ways of doing it using algebraic geometry, but I'm not going to go into it. So given that we have a nice group law on the set of points on the elliptic curve, now we want to reduce things more to P. And recall that the group law only involves arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And all those things still carry over mod P up to division by zero. So we have a group, and this is going to be finite because there are only finitely many points. Um, uh, because there are only finitely many points up to uh, multiples of P. And we, this is the group which we will eventually try to use to replace the multiplicate group of the integers modulo p. So the natural question to ask is how many points are there? And I will call the number of points on this group the order of e modulo p. Um, turns out we have a good guess. The answer is around p plus one because there are p choices for x. We expect about half of them to give you a square for x cubed plus ax plus b. But for those half which give you a square, there are two choices for y, generically speaking. So you expect two times p over two normal points. But there's one more point at infinity. So we guess p plus one. Turns out it's not that bad. Um, you can prove uh, this was the theorem of Hasse that the order of points of an elliptic curve mod p is at most two times the square root of p away from p plus one. Uh, I should mention that this theorem is sort of deep and it's the equivalent of the Riemann hypothesis for the elliptic curves, except it has been proven so I can use it. Um, so the natural question to wonder is how is this error term AP distributed? And 
Lens try in the paper which describes the algorithm which I'm going to describe also proved the following theorem for the analysis of the algorithm. Uh, you don't have to read that. You can read this. Uh, what it says is, uh, the error is sort of roughly speaking uniformly distributed, sort of roughly speaking in the sense that S over root P is what you would expect for a uniform distribution, but there are log P factors all around, so it's log P away from uniform distribution. But basically it's uniform. Uh, and so, with all the theoretical backgrounds out of the way, I can proceed to describe the algorithm. And the idea of the elliptic curve algorithm is that we re replace the multiplicative group of the integers mod p with the group of an arbitrary elliptic curve. And for that, we need one condition. We need the condition that the order of the elliptic curve is smooth. And this is something I will talk about in the, analysis, in the complexity analysis. But another thing is we want if we have some two numbers which add up to the identity, then we want somehow that gives us a non-trivial divisor of n. And how, why is that true? Because recall earlier that if two, you have two numbers which sum up to the identity, then in the actual computation process, you are trying to divide by zero. And that's not going to work. Uh, but you are trying to by, divide by zero modulo p you are actually working modulo n. So you are not actually trying to divide by zero. What you are trying to do is divide by a non-invertible element, which is equally bad. But it's good, because if we have a non-invertible element modulo n, then the greatest common divisor of that with n is going to give us a non-trivial factor. So in summary, we want the computation of p plus q to fail. If that computation fails, then we have succeeded. And with that in mind, we this is the algorithm. First, we select a search limit B. Uh, this, the choice of this B is going to depend on the, prime, the size of the prime factor we are aiming for. And given this B, we search a random elliptic curve and a random point on that curve over, let's say, integers modulo n. So we are working modulo n the entire time. And now we will try to compute uh, we, are, we will try to compute this point P added to itself many times. And this notation of multiplying P by a number is really just P adding to itself that many times. And this is the equivalent in this case of the earlier when you are raising a number to a large power. And so you are trying to compute this. If you are unlucky and you manage to actually compute it, then you have failed. So you should go back to step one and choose a new curve and start again. This really means that the curve you have chosen does not have a smooth order over P for any prime divisor P of N. But if you have failed to compute the number, then good, you are almost done. By the process we, I described earlier, you get a non-trivial factor modulo N. So if it's not N, then we are done. We solve the problem. If you get N, and this corresponds to the case when the order of E is smooth over all prime divisors of N, and that is highly unlikely. So it's very rare we actually fail at this step, but if you happen to fail at this step, go back to one, choose a new curve again. And so I will do some, not do some heuristic analysis of this algorithm. Uh, uh, where we def so let's define the quantity Rb to be the probability that a random elliptic curve is uh, going to have a B smooth order modulo P. Note that I'm fixing a particular prime P and this analysis is going to give us the probability that, the, well, the expected time it will take for the algorithm to extract that particular prime factor P of N. So once we have this prime, once we have the prime P fixed, this RB is going to depend on B. And for each elliptic curve, you are going to succeed in finding P in, uh, with probability RB, and you are going to fail with probability one minus RB, so you have a geometric distribution. And for that, so you would expect one over RB 
uh, curves. You would expect to try that many curves before you can get a factorization of n. And now we need to think about how many operations does it take to look at each curve. Uh, turns out this is a correct number. Uh, to compute the least common, you, you need to add a point P to itself, a least common multiple of all numbers less than or equal to B times. It uh, turns out that requires B log log B operations. Uh, you basically do a C on all numbers less than or equal to B, find all the prime powers, and then use the an analog of fast modular exponentiation, sort of fast addition of points on elliptic curves. And per elliptic curve point addition, you will need to add two numbers, you will need to add things, you need to multiply things, and you will need to divide things all down modulo n. So those can all be done in log n squared time. So basically, each curve will take this amount of time to check. So in total, the complexity is this. Note that I absorb the log log b term into the polynomial part, because if log log b is not polynomial time n or less, you should really consider choosing a different algorithm. And b is a parameter which we get to choose. So the way we choose b is we want to minimize this expression which is roughly what we estimate to be the total complexity of the algorithm. And to estimate that, we need to know something about RB. And we do. Well, we sort of do. There is a theorem by Canfield, Erdős, and Pomerance, which basically states, which basically gives you the probability that a number less than or equal to x is B smooth for this particular value of B. Note that this is number is less than or equal to x, and we know from Hasse's theorem that the number of points on the elliptic curve is very close to x. So for the lack of better information, let's assume this is the same probability for numbers within two root x of x. Um, we can't actually prove much in that direction. Um, recently, there was a paper, well, recently, in 2013, there was a paper which manages to prove that there exists at least one smooth number within two root x times log x raised to some power away from x. But even assuming some very strong hypothesis, stronger than the Riemann hypothesis, we cannot even prove that there exists one smooth number within two root x from x. So the theoretical work on this is pretty dismal, but we might as well assume we know what's going on. And since we are assuming things, we might as well further assume that the number of points on the elliptic curve is actually uniformly distributed, subject to the constraint of Hasse. So finally, we, will, we get this heuristics, so to speak, that the probability that the order of an elliptic curve is smooth, uh, is smooth with respect to this parameter is that. Uh, it turns out by recent numerical and theoretical work that RB may actually be higher, but that higher may only be a constant multiple, so it doesn't really affect the actual asymptotics. So let's proceed with this hypothesis. And by varying alpha, we can vary B, and we can get different sizes of B. So the complexity, the sub-exponential part of the complexity is that. And we want to minimize this expression with respect to alpha, which happens that alpha equals to one over the square root of two. And so we get the final complexity of the elliptic curve algorithm being that thing. Uh, some key features. This log n squared is a polynomial time series, so it's small. Uh, and this, as I mentioned earlier, it's sub-exponential, but not in log n, in log p. This back, goes back to my earlier point that n can be huge. But as long as n has a prime divisor, which is small, say around 30 digits long, then this algorithm will terminate in reasonable time because it only depends on the, it basically only depends on the smallest prime factor of n. So of course, uh, the algorithm I have described is quite basic and there are a lot of improvements to be made. One thing is the choice of elliptic curves. Uh, remember I said, emphasized earlier that uh, only for the purpose of this talk is an elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. Well, it's sort of true, but there are different parameterizations of elliptic curves. And using some of them, you can get much faster group operations. And furthermore, if you choose your parameters cleverly, you can increase 
the probability of success by a constant factor. Um, another theorem is recall that the optimum value of B is L of P raised to the power of one over root two. So because P is what we are trying to find, we have actually no idea what the optimal choice of B is before we start factoring. So the idea is we start by looking we start by looking at a reasonable number of B, something like two million, say, so that it's easy to sieve out all the prime powers less or equal to it. And there are numerical works and theoretical works which tells you the probability that you are going to find a prime factor of a certain digit. Um, and if you're aiming for prime factors of a particular digit, and after you have tried a certain number of curves, you still haven't found it, then you can safely conclude, well, you can, conclude that there is probably no factor um, in that range that you're looking for. So at which point you can either increase B, which will give you more factors, which gives you a larger range of factors you are looking for, or you can go back and look at some of the general methods for factorization. And another thing is what's known as the phase two extension. So we, earlier we required that the order of a elliptic curve mod P to be smooth. Uh, that is quite a restrictive condition. Uh, with phase two extensions, there are particular elliptic curve orders uh, such that even, if it's, even though it's not smooth, we may still be able to extract a factor via that elliptic curve. And we will see an example of this later. There are a few different types of phase two extensions. And the final thing is you can work over multiple elliptic curves simultaneously and one major speed up this provides is inversion modulo n. There turns out to be quick amortized algorithms for multiple inversions mod n. And if you work more over multiple elliptic curves, uh, you can reduce the complexity involved in the bottleneck of the computation, which is to invert an element modulo n. So for the end, I will show you an example of the factorization of the tenth Fermat number two to the power of 1024 plus one. You see some very easy, some algorithms say even the P minus one algorithm, you can very quickly find two prime factors, those two, but then you end up with a 291 digit number which can be proven to be composite. And this 291 digit number was factored in 1999 into a 40-digit number and a 252-digit number, which was then proven prime. You see uh, primality prov proving algorithms. Um, so recall earlier that even on modern computers, as around 300-digit number is just barely within the power of the general number field C. So factoring you C291, it's sort of impossible using a generalized algorithm. But it's possible to factor using the elliptic curve method because Wavi's prime factor is small-ish. And he tried 10 curves with a search limit of 2 million. It turns out this curve worked. Um, recall earlier that I said you can use different, different parameterizations. He used what's called a Montgomery parameterization. And there is a one parameter family of Montgomery curves, which gives you really nice properties. And this A is not generated at random, it's generated using a given formula based on one seed parameter, which they chose to be the initial time of the computation. Um, so uh, why does the elliptic curve method work? Because over this, over the field continue uh, P sub 40 elements, the elliptic curve that I showed you earlier has this many points on it. Uh, notice that I said the search limit is two million. So every prime factor less than up to this point are all less than or equal to two million. So up, up to this point, the number would be two million smooth, but not this number. This number is beyond two million. So what they did, so what actually happened was a phase two extension allowed us to factor a C291, even though the order is not initially smooth. And I should say this is a genuine uh, improvement over the P minus one algorithm because that is powerless to deal with it. P sub 40 minus one has a 231 digit, 223 digit prime factor. And to search up to that level would be you might as well try to division or general number field sieve. And 
to conclude the talk, I will show you a late chart of the recent records of elliptic curve factorization. I believe the largest factor, those are all found by elliptic curve factorization, the vertical axis is the number of digits in the factor found. And the most recent record was in 2013, an 83-digit number was found. And in fact, more recently, say around last Thursday, somebody announced that they have computed the total number of legal goal positions on a 19 by 19 board. And just for the sake of fun, they decided to factorize that number using leave the curve method. Turns out there are five prime factors, two of which has at least 30 digits. And according to the website, they run it on their personal computer in a couple of hours. So I would say that's a pretty impressive performance for the curve method. And I would like, just like to leave you with a quote by Richard Hamming, that the purpose of computing is insights, not numbers. Despite the amount of numbers I have shown, I hope that you have gained some insight into factorization algorithms. Thank you.